Hello and welcome inside Alumni Field for another presentation of WCBN Sports' coverage of Michigan softball. I'm Alex Drain, joined today by Adam Bressler here, and Michigan is concluding their four-game homestand against Maryland. It's their first homestand since the NCAA uh, Regionals nearly two years ago. This team getting re-familiarized in competitive play in their home ballpark, but uh, it's been a good series so far for Michigan took the first three games and now they are trying to close out the sweep here today against the Terrapins we also understand that this audio may be used on the Big Ten Network Plus broadcast and so if anyone is watching there we welcome you in as well we'll run you through the starting lineups rather quickly as this game is just about to get started Jaden McFarland will lead off for the Terps followed by Taylor Okada and then Regan Kerr, they'll be up 1-2-3 to begin this top of the first. After that, it'll be Trinity Schlauterbeck, Katie Dustin, Campbell Klein, Ruby Butler, Taylor Liguri, and Michaela Jones. Courtney Weish will be on the mound for the Terrapins. For Michigan, Alex Duraco in the circle. He'll give you the defense left to right. Taylor Bump at third. Natalia Rodriguez at short. Julia Jimenez at second. And Lou Allen over there at first in the outfield. It is Kirsten, Blair, and Hoganrod left to right. Hannah Carson behind the plate. And Storaco gets ready for the first pitch to Jada McFarlane. And it's taken for a strike. McFarlane leads Maryland with a 333 average, hitting in that leadoff spot. McFarlane, a lefty hitter against the righty Storaco. We'll get into the game storylines here in a moment. Storaco's second pitch is popped up, arcing, and out of play. Nice catch by the usher over there standing all by himself. Just snagged it right out of midair on the looping, tailing foul ball. Now the count quickly 0-2, and that's where Storaco likes it. Heavy strikeout pitcher will tell you those stats in a moment, but looking for her first victim of the afternoon. 0-2 on the way. Swing and a miss. There it is. One batter up, one batter down, and it didn't take too many pitches either. Not at all. Three-pitch strikeout right there. Storaco is number two in the NCAA in strikeouts per seven innings and is just having a phenomenal junior season. Second as well in ERA entering the weekend in the entire country. Number five in hits allowed per seven innings has just been so, so stingy as there's a Paul High to Taylor Okada. Enters this game with a .55 ERA and a whip about the same as well. 1 0 to Okada. That one way high as well. 2 0. Straco pitched in the game yesterday, or actually in the first game yesterday. It was a doubleheader on Saturday, as that's going to be the case across the Big Ten slate this season. And she was pretty much her usual self yesterday. Seven innings, three hits, 11 strikeouts, no runs allowed in a crisp Michigan victory as they swept yesterday's doubleheader. Terps just trying to get one on their way out of town. Carson goes out there to have a conversation with Storaco. Looked like they were just on a different page for a moment. Now Carson goes back and sets up behind the plate. Storaco's behind 2-0 to Okada. There's a pitch taken for a strike. Okada, not a ton of power. No homers on the year. Does have three doubles and two triples. Perfect in stolen bases. This is a Terps team that has about everyone get involved in the stolen base column. If they need to get runners on. That's something they've struggled with this weekend. 2-1 on the way. Taken, I think, just outside. Now 3-1. And uh, Maryland is looking for their first base runner of the afternoon as they quickly get ahead in this count for the second batter. 3-1. Okada swings, hits this one right over to second. Jimenez is right there. And a quick flip over to Allen for the second out. Two up, two down. That'll bring Regan Kerr to the plate. And Kerr is one of the only Maryland hitters to have done any real damage this weekend against the really just terrific Michigan pitching did have a solo home run on the weekend. Checks in at a 280 batting average, 352 on base. High strikeouts, though, 24 of them to lead 
the nine players that are in the Maryland lineup today. Swings and taps this one foul. In her first two seasons at Michigan, Stiracco's weakness was the home run. Consistently gave up far too much hard contact. She has changed that, and that has ascended her from a promising young pitcher to one of the best aces in the entire sport. The windup of the 0-1. That one is... I don't think she made contact. It went off of Carson's glove, though, and back to the backstop. Regardless... 0-2. Oh Straco toes the rubber ahead 0-2. Oh See if she can rack up her second strikeout of the inning right here. The windup, the pitch, and check swing went around on a pitch way high and out of the zone. And that'll end it for a crisp 1-2-3 first inning. Straco looks locked in so far, and we'll get to see the Michigan offense here coming up. Absolutely. Two strikeouts and then a uh, ground ball right to second. Uh, can't ask for any more efficiency from Michigan's pitching right there. And uh, now it's up to the offense to provide some run support. This weekend, not a ton of scoring from Michigan. Yesterday's games, uh, the first game was... Owen uh, was a 2 2 nothing win for Michigan, and the second one was a 5-1 win. So comparatively not a ton of offense for either team. Well, we should note that, I mean, Maryland <coughs> struggles at the plate, but they are a pretty good pitching team. And the challenge of this Big Ten season, really, you play 44 games. The challenge is just staying perfect against the teams that are really not in the hunt for the top. This Maryland team enters... At 11 and 16, they're not in the running uh, for any high seeding and you know making the NCAA tournament at all. So the challenge for Michigan is just sweeping these four games, and that's something that Northwestern and Minnesota, Michigan's two rivals for the top of the conference, did not do. Both of those teams dropped one game against Maryland in part because Maryland's a good pitching team. Yeah, and this season when you got uh, four game uh, series over the weekends, you got to have uh, deep quality pitching. You can't. Uh, and that, that's what makes a difference between a sweep and then maybe uh, fighting back a win or two in a uh, weekend series. Well, the luxury for Michigan is the number one pitching team in the conference is, generally speaking, if they score three runs in a game, they're going to win that game almost every time. Uh, obviously, we have to see how they fare against Northwestern and Minnesota, but that's been the case so far this season, just dominant pitching from the two-headed monster of Storaco and Bobian. And the offense, to their credit, is starting to heat up. Michigan after scoring only about three runs per game uh, in their first nine games, have now scored 39 in their last uh, 12, or sorry, 75 in their last 15, which ups that uh, considerably to about five runs per game from three runs per game. And as a result, the record over that 15-game stretch, 14-1 and one after starting 6-3. and three. And the power has come on as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. First pitch from Weish is a called strike to Lexi Blair, Michigan's best hitter by average by a mile. 463, of course, Michigan fans will remember that Lexi hit 400 as a freshman, scuffled a little bit through a slump to begin last season. Then, of course, the season was massively truncated and canceled, so we really didn't get a great sense of her as a sophomore. There's a pitch taken outside, one and one. But this year, as a junior, she has come back with a vengeance in a 463 average, 720 slugging percentage, nine doubles, four homers, just four strikeouts to eight walks. She's got as many homers as strikeouts this year. 1-1 one, one is taken outside as well, 2-1. and one. And this is kind of the, you don't want to say final form, because players are always improving, and she's got at least one more, if not two more years in a Michigan uniform with the potential of a COVID fifth year red shirt. But... This is kind of the advanced player that has evolved from the phenomenal freshman season she had two years ago that we all envisioned. 2-1 swing and a high pop-up, but this is arcing into foul ground, and it will land a few rows in front of us in the stands. Count runs to 2-2. Two and two. And Lexi with that high on base, really in charge of just getting aboard and setting up the next hitter is in the lineup. Rodriguez, Allen, and Jimenez will go through the full lineup in a moment. 522 OBP. You can't ask for any more from a leadoff hitter. 
2-2 on the way. That one low, 3-2. and two. Blair, Rodriguez, Allen. Then Jimenez, Carson, and Esman, 4-5-6. Hoganrod, Bump, and Kirsten, 7-8-9. For the Wolverines, Lexi's worked the count full, showing that great plate discipline. The corners are pulled in a bit for the Terps. Jones especially over there at third. 3-2, and she's out in front of it and grounds it. Sharply foul right off the netting that protects the Michigan dugout. Klein, McFarland, and Okada left to right in the outfield. Jones, Butler, Liguri, and Kerr left to right in the infield. Weish in the circle. And Dustin behind the plate. 3-2 count. Weish spins the ball in her right hand. Gets ready for the windup. Full count offering. And that's ball four. Lexi Blair works a walk, and she'll be aboard to begin this bottom of the first. That'll bring up Natalia Rodriguez. And Lexi Blair really worked to get that uh, base, that walk. We mentioned her high OBP and her uh, refusal just to strike out, and she showed it right there. She fouled off a couple pitches and finally drew the walk. So Lexi on first to begin this bottom of the first, and she's got the speed to run. And Natalia shows bunt. It goes way over her head to the backstop, and Blair will scamper on down to second. I was about to introduce the possibility of Blair taking second on a steal. She's six for six in stolen base attempts this year, but doesn't have to do that. First pitch gets way away from Weish, and... Well over the head of Dustin, no chance for the catcher there. And Blair able to move up to second base, and now already a runner in scoring position for the Wolverines. Rodriguez is a senior. Now, of course, as we've mentioned several times, players could have the option of coming back next year with the COVID red shirt. But uh, Rodriguez, in her four years at Michigan, has been a very consistent hitter in that shortstop position. Asked to bunt quite a bit. We'll see if Hutch asks her to do so here. Jones and Kerr pulled in at the corners, awaiting a potential bunt. She shows it, pulls it back again, and that one taken in the dirt. Now 2-0. and Llewellyn, Michigan's RBI leader with 19, is waiting on deck. Maryland's corner infielders, uh, Kerr and Jones, are playing really deep in likely expecting possibly another bunt shown. She's shown it both times so far, but neither pitch was at all palatable for that. 2-0 on the way, lays it down right in front of the plate, and it does the job. Quick throw over from Jones there to the second baseman, Liguri, covering the bag. Lexi moves up to third, and now the job will be for Lou Allen to drive this run in. Lou's hitting 304 on the season, 390 OBP, slugging at 522. She's tied with Lexi for the team lead in home runs, and Allen's an up and down Michigan career littered with injuries at times, but is finally now having two straight injury free off seasons, and she's playing very, very well for mm -hmm. Michigan at the moment. And 19 RBIs already this season, runner on third right now, looking to extend it. Lou is the engine that drives in enough. A big portion of the runs that Lexi provides in getting on base. There's a called strike to Allen 0 and 1. Lou didn't play much as a freshman, played a little bit more as a sophomore, but dealt with injuries both years. And then last year was really starting to show a lot of signs before the season was canceled. There's a ball that skips in. Good block by Dustin. Allen at the plate, and Jimenez on deck. Runner on third, one out. Now the count is one and one. Michigan trying to manufacture a run. And with Straco in the circle, when you get that lead, you automatically feel so much better about your prospects in the game. Lou, the righty hitter against the righty Weish. That pitch is a called strike, one and two. And this run is totally manufactured. Uh... Uh, Lexi Blair advanced or got on base on a walk, advanced on a pass ball, and then went to third on a bunt. No, no real hits involved there. Not yet. Lexi's got a lot of speed. 
can definitely scamper home if Luke can put this ball in play. One, two, and she just gets a piece, taps it foul. One and two the count. Weish looking to go to a strikeout pitch here. And that one way high over the backstop. Lexi's going to come home, flip in, and not in time. I think the throw might have been in time, but uh, pitcher was unable to secure it and apply the tag. It would have been close. And Michigan gets the job done. They take a 1-0 lead, and Lexi Blair was ready to run pretty much as soon as that got to the backstop. She came out with wild abandon, and right now Courtney Weish is just losing control of those pitches up high that are sailing over the head of the catcher, Dustin. And now we're going to have a conversation in the circle with a member of the Maryland coaching staff. I think Weish might be a little banged up there as she got slid into. That throw might have hit Lexi Blair. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, she was sliding in, and the throw was right there. Weish had trouble finding it. I'm looking at the Wolverine schedule this season. And when they have scored at least three runs the entire season, they have only lost one time. And granted, they only have four losses on the season, so it's not an incredibly huge sample size. But uh, their pitching is solid, and once they get, um, once they get enough run support uh, for their pitchers, they are easily able to secure, uh, secure the game, it seems like, this season. So after all that commotion, the count is two and two on Allen with the bases empty. She swings and laces this one into right field at the track, at the wall, and home I run. think it's a home run. That's what the umpire, yeah, the umpire is signaling. Yeah, the umpire is signaling, and now Allen, who slid into second, will get to trot on home. That is a solo blast, her fifth of the season, and Michigan goes up 2 nothing. It was a line drive that just hit, I think, off that sort of fenced railing on top of the yellow line, and then it bounced yeah. down on top of the yellow line. It was a real liner, and uh, the outfielder was playing it like it was in play, but the umpire just called it a home run. Gave Michigan a double, uh, doubled their lead. And I guess that uh, pass ball didn't even amount to anything then. Yeah. They have changed the scoring decision on the Blair uh, scoring. The first one was a wild pitch. The second one is called a pass ball officially run unearned to Weish, but that second run that Allen just scored on the home run, that will be earned. 2 nothing, Michigan now in the bottom of the first, still only one out in the frame for Julia Jimenez. There's a pitch way outside for ball one, and that fits into what we were talking about a moment. Michigan 17 homers in their last 13 games after just one in their first 11. Make that now 18 in their last 14 and counting here today. And with only one out at this rate, they'd get <laughs> quite, a, <laughs> quite a lot of home runs today. Julia Menes has got two on the year. 1-0 the count. Weish winds up, and Jimenez well out in front of that one, and she shoots it foul over towards that VIP parking lot. And a couple of Terps players are running down to the bullpen right now. If they're trying to get into the bullpen now they got the door open yeah. there are some players down there already throwing 1-1 one, one count that pitch well high 2-1 and one. Jimenez has been pretty consistent around 260 to 300 this year in the batting average he's been a solid player would like to see her take some more walks OBP at just 325 doesn't strike out much, though, either. Four strikeouts to three walks puts a lot of balls in play. 2-1 coming, waves and misses on a pitch down low. 2-2, two and two. Anna Carson on deck. Michigan now ahead 2-0. Two, two runs on one hit in the inning. They finally put the hit up on the line score, the scoreboard out in left field.
Michigan, they come into this game with a five-game win streak, too, so a win would be huge. Foul back two and two, and we'll definitely talk more about the standings implication of this game in the final month of the season upcoming. Later on, trying to finish off this four-game sweep of the Terps as Jimenez hits that one foul. Now we'll wait on another 2-2 offering. Shrugs, and now the wind up, the pitch. That one popped foul, and that will arc and get out of play. Bouncing off a couple of benches, and then we'll roll down. That same usher who caught a ball earlier thought about running up to get it. Instead, a fan will go and get that. There are a few fans in attendance. They're all family members and close friends, etc., of the players I'm on the two teams. How many Maryland fans came out? That's quite. I know it's quite a hoof uh, from College Park to Ann Arbor. Yeah, about eight hours, but there are quite a few here. They've got one section, section six, there down the third base side. Couple of fans in section se uh, five too. Yep. Two two, and Jimenez swings and pokes this one into the gap, and it will be off the glove of McFarland in center. Quick throw in, and Jimenez. Gets into second. That should go down as a double. It did go off the glove, but that was going to be a tough, tough play for McFarland to make. And it was on the run, and yeah. uh, she was on the warning track too. So yeah, I think you got to give her the benefit of the doubt there. And if she makes that play, it's a you know heck of a play. If she doesn't, goes down as a double, and that is indeed what the scores mark it as. So now, despite missing the initial catch too, she quickly got it in yeah. almost. Uh, was picked off the runner at second. There was no one even covering him. That was the, there was no one really there to make the play. But now we have a conversation again between Dustin and Weish in what is becoming a very long bottom of the first. Quick recap. Blair walked, got to second on a wild pitch, bunted over by Rodriguez, scores on officially a passed ball, and then moments after that passed ball scores the run, Lou Allen hits a solo home run, and now Jimenez hits a double, and those two hits, Jimenez and Allen, almost identical. Hard line drives, Allen a bit more to right field, the Jimenez one more to right center, but both you know, hit right on the screws, hard liners, a lot of contact right now. And it's gotta be the concern for the Maryland coaching staff. Hannah Carson checks in now, and she swings and pokes this one foul. And that's, you know, that's one of the problems when you face a team like Michigan is you're down 2 nothing. You say, okay, it's not too bad. But with Starocco in the circle, you really cannot allow this to go any further. If you fall down 4 nothing, 5 nothing, the game's over. Exactly. I, I mentioned uh, when Michigan scores at least three runs, they only have one loss. And that loss went into uh, extra innings, too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even in the uh, original seven. Carson now with a chance to... Drive in a run. She's got nine RBIs on the season. 0-1 the count. She swings and hits this one softly into left center field. And they're going to hold the runner, Jimenez, at third. Heading to second is Carson. That's a really smart base running play. She knew the throw was going to come home to hold the runner at third and was able to round first and take second. That should be a single taking second on the throw. Yeah, the, the scoreboard's saying double, but I yeah. bet in the scorebook it might go down as a single. It might not. It depends on how they score it, but it definitely was not a, you know, typical double. And if there's not a runner on third, it's definitely not a double. But but that's a heads-up play yeah, because sure. now it takes away that double play option, too. And that looks like it's going to end Courtney Weish's day. It's like we're going to have a pitching change here with runners on second and third now. Yep, it is a single taking second on the throw. I think the problem is the scoreboard doesn't have a patented graphic for yeah. a single taking second on the throw. <laughs> they should get one of those <laughs> yeah. for the, like, one uh, one time a week it, it happens. They could pull it up. So it looks like, I think it'll be, I'm trying to see that number. Looks like 21, maybe. The ponytail is, is blocking the number plate. Yep, 21. 21, that Haley is. Haley Ellefson. Haley Ellefson. Pull up her stats the here. The junior from uh, Mayo, Florida, out of Lafayette High School. She has... Uh, 
Looks like she played for Florida Southwestern and then transferred to the Terps. Two-way player, pitcher and a hitter. On the season, a 7.64 ERA. She's already played twice this weekend. Yep. She played uh, on Friday, giving up one hit and two strikeouts. No then, runs in that one, but then got roughed yeah. up yesterday. Two innings, five hits, one walk, four runs, three of them earned. Definitely not a sterling stat line so far, but obviously an opportunity to right the ship here. But she'll have to do it with runners on second and third, only one out, and facing one of Michigan's hottest hitters, if not the hottest hitter in the Michigan lineup. Lauren Esman, nine for her last 16 at the plate to raise the average all the way up to 360 and to work her way in to the lineup. First pitch coming, she swings and fouls it off herself. Esman was not an everyday player at the start of the year, but her bat recently coming alive is impossible now to keep out of the lineup. Doesn't really have a natural defensive position listed as a utility player. She can also pitch, but hasn't this year. And she comes in at a key time for the Wolverines. Two runners in scoring position. One swing of the bat could crack this game wide open if it hasn't been cracked open already. Esmond behind 0-1 in the count to Ellefson. Ellefson puts the ball in the glove, the wind up, the 0-1 coming, and that's a little low. Esmond had uh, three hits uh, yesterday in the uh, first game. And it was on Friday night that she hit one of the hardest hit and farthest reaching home runs I've ever seen in alumni field. We'll talk about that in a moment. 1-1 one, one, rolled right back to the circle. Only one play is to first. That's a nice play by Ellefson to check the runner back to third. Throw over to first. That's a big second out, and it doesn't advance the runners. And that'll bring up Haley Hogan. Rod Esmond's home run on Friday hit the like back of the right field bleachers there, that final railing after the top bleacher. It oh, was wow. it was about you know maybe a foot higher and it was gonna leave the stadium entirely, but that's a big out for Ellefson there to keep something like that from happening. And that was a heads up play too, is checking yeah. the runner, uh, keeping keeping the run from scoring as well because uh, Jimenez was about a third of the way down the base path. First pitch fouled back by Haley. Hogan run now in her fifth year with the Wolverines. A 233 average, scuffling a little bit this season, but looking to get it going. Started now in 19 games, appeared in 23 of the 25. This be a good time to get back in the groove. Takes a strike on the outer edge. Now quickly behind 0-2. Ellefson trying to wiggle out of this jam and strand a couple of runners in scoring position. Taylor Bump on deck, Jimenez at third, Carson at second. 0-2, taken high, check swing, did not go. Tanya Garrick, the home plate umpire, appeals down to Jonathan Hand at first. Chad Geffro over at third. Hogan Rod. Steps back in. The Zealand, Michigan native waits on the one two. Swing and just rolls this one over foul. And staying alive uh, with two outs and two strikes right there. Trying to put, uh, as long as she gets on base, at least one, if not uh, two runs, will probably come in. Certainly a single somewhere into the outfield will probably score two. Runners will be going on contact. That one skips in. Good block there from Katie Dustin. Count at two and two, the windup. The pitch, swing and a liner, caught by the second baseman, Liguri. Leaping up a little bit. Haley hit that one right on the screws. That's a little bit of tough luck. 
A few more feet to the left or right, and two runs probably would have scored. But alas, it is gloved, and Ellefson does a nice job there to wiggle out of the jam. Strands two runners in scoring position. But Michigan grabs the 2-0 early lead, and that is a good place to be with Alex Duraco pitching. She'll go back out there. A long layoff. That first inning took 30 minutes, and the bottom of the first took up about 25 of the 30. Yeah, because the, the top of the first, 1-2-3 <laughs> yeah. two, with two strikeouts and a quick ground out, too. So uh, Michigan... Uh, in this first intermission, I guess we could take a look at the standings and the implications. Michigan currently is at the top of the Big Ten softball standings. However, Minnesota and Northwestern each has more wins than Michigan. Minnesota is, uh, has two more wins than Michigan, plus an additional loss, while yep. Northwestern has one more win than Michigan, plus two additional losses. And that's primarily because... Uh, Michigan series against um, Michigan State that was supposed to be, I guess, three weekends ago now uh, was canceled due to COVID. Yep. So that kind of gave uh, the Wolverines a bit of a, um, I don't know if it's a benefit or not. They well, I mean, Michigan State, yeah, games. Michigan State is not a very good team. I mean, any game where you don't play the top is just an opportunity to trip up. So in some sense, it's a benefit, but also, they, you know, I think if you're their team, you know, the team, you think that that was a chance to bank some wins. They did make up one of those four Michigan State games. That was last week. On Wednesday, they had a yep. midweek uh, mid game. And they'll play a second midweek game at some point in, in early May, but they'll finish with two less games played. I mean, that's a tough thing. We saw this in basketball, too, where, uh, you know, in both the men's and the women's, you got very staggered where teams didn't play the requisite amount of games as there's a foul off to begin this second inning but the season really as you said there comes down to the northwestern and minnesota series and that first one of those two is next weekend here at alumni field against the wildcats oh one count say pitch that just misses the zone one and one trinity slaughter back at the plate just one for 17 on the season the designated player today looking to snap out of a slump One one count. There's a swing and a miss. One and two. Northwestern was in the driver's seat in the conference, and then they got battered by the Gophers last weekend. That cleared the path for Michigan to ascend to number one in the league. But if they want to hold on to that, they're going to have to play well. Those two big weekends. There's a swing and a miss, and a called strike three. Sorry, just a strike three overall. On Schlauterbeck, that's now three strikeouts for Storaco in the first four batters, one down in the second. Yeah, Michigan, big series against Northwestern starting on Friday, and then uh, two weekends from now they travel to Minneapolis and face uh, a four-game series against the Gophers. Here's the catcher, Dustin, swings and misses the Maryland hitters, really chasing the high deliveries. All four of those games in Minnesota will be on BTN. Yes, and a number of the games next weekend will be on television as well. Yep, we got an ESPNU game on Friday and then BTN on Sunday. And then the Saturday games will be on BTN Plus with our audio laid over that as well. And you can listen to the whole Northwestern series here on WCBN Sports on YouTube as well. Swing and a miss from Dustin now quickly behind 0-2. Storaco looks... Very confident in command right now. Puts the ball in the glove, the wind up, the pitch, swing and a miss. Woof. Four strikeouts and five batters face. This is uh, has the potential to be a very quick game. And these are, you know, Maryland's going to have to recalibrate their plate approach because these are not good looking at bats either. Three yeah, or four pitches. Exactly. That, that one... Uh, O Okada uh, racked up a uh, full count. But yep. Besides that, it's been pretty quick. Here's Campbell Klein. Slap hitter takes a ball. 1 0. Klein with a 250 batting average this season. No home runs, but a handful of stolen bases. 1 0 coming, waves and misses. 1 and 1. 
Interestingly, Klein has two triples, but no doubles. <laughs> if uh, she goes beyond first, she'll extend it yeah. to third. 1-1 <laughs> one, one count. That pitch is low. Two and one. Straco checks the wristband. Klein, a lefty hitter. The traditional slap formation and takes a called strike now. Two and two. Butler on deck if necessary, but Maryland's just looking for their first base runner of the game, trailing 2 0 here in the top of the second. Wind up the pitch. Called strike three on the outside corner, and that will be a 1 2 3 inning for Starocco. Strikes out the side, and she's got five Ks in the first six batters, and the Michigan hitters will go back to the plate in the bottom of the second. You're listening to Michigan Softball on WCBN Sports. And this is the exact start that Michigan needed, a solid, solid opening from Starocco, and then Michigan's offense uh, has come alive, and they got a um, two runs and then two additional runners left on base, so their offense is really barking, even if it's only two runs. I know it uh, might not seem like a ton on the scoreboard, but they... Uh, their offense was so potent, they, they forced uh, Weish to come on out. Yep. After only one, one out recorded, too. And all, they had a handful of solid knocks, too. It wasn't even uh, blue pits. One home run, line drive straight to right field. Another line drive that uh, bounced in for a double. And a third one that was... A screeching laser caught by the second baseman for the third and final out. I definitely hit a lot of balls hard in that inning. Ellefson begins the second inning, her first full frame of work after relieving Courtney Weish, who recorded just one out. Today is senior day for the Michigan managers. They were honored before the game, and there was just a graphic on the scoreboard. We should note that the scoreboard has been updated to add the 2019 Big Ten Championship. Yep, I guess it uh, was a bit long in the making, long time in the making, but they finally got it updated. Well, this is a, you know, the first home weekend at alumni in two years' time. Feels kind of hard to believe, but indeed that's the case, and it's one of, unfortunately, with the Michigan State Series being canceled, it's one of only three home weekends this year, Northwestern and Rutgers, the other two. First pitch to Taylor Bump bounces in 1 0. Of course, there is the potential Michigan could host a regional. Not super likely at this moment. They are 22nd in the poll. They, they hosted the a, in 2019. Yes. They had one. You need to get in the top 16 to host that, but obviously the poll is not the same as the selection committee, so it's hard to know exactly where you stand there's a strike one and one to bump but a solid finish to the season yeah. could be what's needed if they close strong down the stretch and they you know take three of four from minnesota and three of four from northwestern and win the conference you might have a shot now bump hits this one deep to left center field back to the track to the wall and it's gone taylor bump strokes her fourth home run of the season to left center field and michigan takes a three nothing lead in this game and with uh, one swing of the bat, just cracks this open even further. And Taylor Bump continues Michigan's power surge here in this stretch of the schedule. Now 19 homers in their last 14 games, and she's heated up as well with that tall 5'10 frame. We've always talked about her prodigious power stats in high school. Could it ever come together? But starting to look a little bit like that right now. And she hits a homer to put Michigan up 3-0, their second homer of the game. And that'll bring up Sierra Kirsten now with nobody out. It's a pitch outside. Kirsten is the only freshman in Michigan's lineup today. Came in as part of a four-player freshman class. And... 
Kind of a surprising one to rise out of it. Was definitely not one of the most heralded members in terms of recruiting rankings. But has found herself a niche here so far in the season as she takes a strike one-on-one -on -one as sort of a contact hitter and a, a decent defensive player in left field. Hitting at the bottom of the order. We'd like to see the on-base get a little higher. She has not taken any walks this season. Swings and hits this one. Foul down the line. Count runs to one and two. Thais Gonzalez was in the lineup at one point earlier in the year, but Kirsten and Hoganrod have nailed down the spots in the outfield. At least right now. Count one and two. Ellefson winds up the pitch. Oh, boy. Swing and a miss on one in the dirt. And the quick throw down from Dustin to Kerr gets the out. And that is, I believe, the first strikeout of the game for the Michigan hitters. And we flip to the top now with one out in the inning. Yep, first strikeout because uh, Michigan had that bunt for an out and then that grounder to the pitcher for the second out, that line drive to second for the third. So that, that will be the first uh, strikeout, and it was swinging and uh, well in the dirt above the plate. Lexi Blair takes a ball high. Lexi led off the game with a walk, came around to score on a passed ball after she moved up to second on a wild pitch and to third on a bunt. Manufactured run for that first run. The last two runs, Michigan have scored anything but manufactured. Solo homers to right center and left center. Is it called strike? Yeah, and that was heads up base running, both to take second and then take home, but it proved unnecessary as uh, uh, Allen just hit that blast outside of the stadium and would have brought her home anyway. 1-1 one, one count. Swings and pokes this one foul. It arcs out of play. Lexi now, she needs to hit a home run if she wants to keep pace with Lou Allen. They entered the game tied with four homers to lead the team. Lou is now pulled ahead with her fifth. And now Bump is tied two with four uh, on the season. Yeah, tied in second with Blair. One, two on the way. Swing and rolls this one over right to first base. And that is a easy, easy play for a curve to tap the back. Now two outs, Ellefson wiggled out of the jam in the first, gives up the solo homer here to begin this inning, but now comes back with a couple confident outs. Stays composed and uh, Rodriguez comes to the plate and she had that uh, bunt in the first inning to advance a runner. And Natalia swings and hits this one into right field on the line and gloved by the right fielder Okada just in the final reaches of fair territory. And that'll do it. A solo homer for Taylor Bump starts the inning. Then Ellefson comes back to get some quick outs and holds the Wolverines to just one more put on the board. But they now lead 3-0 as we head to the top of the third. You're listening to Michigan Softball on WCBN Sports. Big question now for Maryland. Can they solve... Alex Duraco. I think that's a question the entire Big Ten uh, is asking themselves this season. And so far, the answer is a resounding no. <laughs> With five strikeouts and six batters faced. And uh, not a single base runner. No one has touched uh, any square base so far this game for Maryland. They definitely do not look at all plugged in at what Duraco is throwing at them. And these, uh, you mentioned that these at-bats aren't pretty. Uh, they are uh, three or four pitches on average, uh, usually a strike three swinging, a handful of uh, rung up strike threes as well on, on some really uh, nasty looking pitches. Gets the batters uh, just gawking at it. Well, and you know, the problem for Maryland is they now trail three nothing. Storaco has not given up more than three runs in an outing this entire season. And it, it is odd she has two of the Michigan's four recorded losses. Yeah, well, one, she only gave up one earned run. The other one, she only gave up two earned runs. That was when Michigan's offense was really sputtering at the start of the year. And the other problem in trying to claw back into this game is Butler takes a first pitch for a called strike is that amazingly, 
In 82 innings pitched, Duraco this season has allowed just five extra base hits. Five. Wow. Only 33 hits allowed, but of those 33, only five were extra bases. Two doubles, one triple, and two homers. 0-1 swing and a high pop up in the infield. Bumps calling for it. No, instead Jimenez will come in and make the play just inside the pitching circle for the first out. So, you know, when you're talking about how do you get back into a game against Storaco, your, ch your chance really is, is walks and singles, which makes it that much tougher to get runs on the board. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to... Unlike Michigan's offense so far, it's going to be tough to come back with a uh, swing of the bat. But um, at least Maryland made some contact there, too, and uh, avoided a strikeout. There's a ball high. And it's tough to understate just how different this is in the past seasons. Straco's now pitched about as many innings as she did in the canceled season last year but has allowed just two homers to the eight she allowed last year. 1-0 on the way, that's a check swing, went around, did Liguri, one and one, and she's allowed just two doubles compared to the seven last year. And you go back to 2019, she'd given up 15 homers in 142 games, way below that right now. One and one count, Liguri takes a strike right down the pipe, and now she's behind one and two. Liguri, the second baseman, comes in with a 286 average. One two count. The wind up and the pitch. Swing and a miss. And that'll be strikeout number six for Storaco. Six strikeouts with eight batters faced as uh, the bottom of the lineup comes up now. Still, a runner has yet to reach first. In any, any means, either a walk or a hit or any other way. That'll bring up Kayla Jones. Swing and a miss. And it, again, it goes to, to say how short these at-bats have been in that Storaco has six strikeouts, but only 29 pitches thrown so far, which is pretty remarkable given that, you know, strikeouts are rather inefficient kind of out when it comes to, to pitch count because you have to throw at least three pitches to get the out. But so there's fortunately, a ball one and one. she's only been throwing about three pitches yeah. for each strikeout. It's not <laughs> much more. So it is, uh, I guess technically it's inefficient, but uh, still pretty, pretty uh, not complaining if you get a three or four pitch strikeout. One, one, swing and a miss. One and two. Straco recorded 11 strikeouts in seven innings yesterday. Cruising way above that pace at the moment. She works quickly. The wind up in the pitch, swing in a arcing foul out of play. Right over towards the press box too, I think right over our heads where it ended up landing. Nobody is up and throwing in the Maryland bullpen right now. Everybody just standing around watching from just over that wall where it says 200 in left field. There's another swing and a foul back. Jones finally just putting the bat on the ball and battling a little bit. Yeah, Jones at the end of the lineup uh, only batting 159 this season. 18 strikeouts as well. There's a swing and a miss. Off-speed pitch and Jones way out in front of it. Storaco collects her seventh strikeout, one for every day of the week. <laughs> and she is through three scoreless and is just in total command of this game. Michigan's hitters have notched a run in each of their first two frames. We'll see if they can do so again here in the third. And nine runners up for Maryland, nine runners down, uh, nine batters down. And... I'm, I just pulled this up, so last inning we were talking about the regionals. Actually, it turns out this season the regional hosts are going to be predetermined, so it's irrelevant to the standings or the seedings or any of that. It's going to be uh, – teams are going to be able to bid to host, and then they will be selected and announced next weekend, actually, April 26th. So a uh, week from yesterday, we will know if Michigan will host – 
uh, softball regional. And then uh, super regionals will be selected from them. I would imagine Michigan might try and bid for one of these. I'm not uh, pregnant. I mean, they to might. Michigan has definitely hosted a lot of regionals and super regionals over Carol Hutchins' long time in Ann Arbor. And if they were looking for a Midwest spot, Michigan would be a pretty good bet to host one. But obviously, the powers of college softball tend to be in the West and the South. So you'd imagine most of the regionals are in those areas. But. And then the uh, college softball World Series will be in Oklahoma City. So As that's, always, yep. Yep, it's already set. But the Super Regionals and the Regionals, this is interesting. So a team might not even play in a regional yeah, that they could host. I think that they would, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about their logic, get them not in those discussions. But you'd have to think they'd want to pick schools that, you know, are better softball schools that have some experience hosting and that, are likely to play in their respective regionals. Absolutely. I think teams like Oklahoma and UCLA and Florida, of course, mainstays. But there's a pitch that bounces in to Lou Allen. They might be looking for uh, teams or programs that have experience yeah. hosting before. And I'm sure, like, COVID precautions would be in there, which states are hardest hit and what regions yeah. could be capable of hosting these 1-0 on the way. Lou swings and hits this one to left field. That one's got a chance again. Backtrack wall. Gone again. Second solo homer of the game for Lou Allen. And she is now up to six on the season. Red hot today. And Michigan leads 4-0. 33% of her home runs have come in the last <laughs> three innings. Yeah, there you go. Season. You talked about how Michigan's offense has been red hot. Their power has been red hot. Today is no exception through three innings, three solo shots. And that one was a blast. That uh, cleared the fence by a good 15 feet. And that's a different direction than her previous one. Her other homer was an oppo shot to right field on a line drive. That one was a towering fly to left center. And it makes it 4 nothing. And it looks like we've got a pitching change. Ellefson is coming out. And... This is number three. Which that is, is not listed on our roster uh, sheet. Trinity uh, oh. Slaughterbeck. Slaughterbeck, yeah. From Williamsport, moving. Maryland. She'll be moving from the designated player spot to pitch. Let's see. And this is not a good sign for the Terrapins. Uh, if you have zero outs in the third, it's only uh, two, uh, six outs recorded, and you already are on your third pitcher. Of uh, the afternoon. Schlotterbeck's numbers are a little bit better than Ellefson. A 3.23 ERA, 1-3-1 whip. Not a high strikeout pitcher, but only allowing a 241 opponent batting average she, against her. She did pitch uh, yesterday, actually, too. So coming off uh, that game, giving up one earned run on four hits. However, also got a strikeout in there as well. How many, How many innings? Uh, let me pull it up. It actually doesn't say. Well, she'll face Jimenez to begin her appearance here in the bottom of the third. Still nobody out in the inning. First pitch called strike. Julia Jimenez reached on a double. Back in the first, what well, was stranded there. Oh, one is low, one and one. And the crowd is getting pretty rowdy already, getting uh, not too many fans out, but making themselves heard. And of course, the bench is always cheering on as well. There's a pitch she's way out in front of, and and as pokes that one off the screen. Slaughterbeck, she went four innings uh, yesterday in the second game and was actually relieved by Ellefson. Well, they have four pitchers that they've been using, and three of them now have already made an appearance here in the Sunday game. One, two, Jimenez swings and hits this one to right field on a line, moving back towards the track but making the catch there is Okada for the first out of the inning. She did pitch in those four innings 50, uh, 50 pitches. 
So uh, coming off a uh, pretty busy weekend for her, assuming Maryland's looking for maybe some long relief work today. Hannah Carson, lefty hitter, checks in. She had a bloop single in the first inning. First pitch swung on and foul. We have some score updates. Definitely interesting scores at the moment. Iowa leads 4-1 on Northwestern in the third. And Nebraska leads 3-1 on Minnesota in the fourth. Michigan would love that those two results could hold, but a lot of innings still to be played. Absolutely. Minnesota, they have an eight-game winning streak. Yep. So uh, Michigan would appreciate any help they could get. And Minnesota was down to Nebraska entering the seventh in the game on Friday and rallied to win. So Michigan would like some help from the Huskers there. There's a ball, one and one to Carson. One, one coming, Carson swings and hits this one over to second. Glove there on the backhand throw over and just getting the runner, Carson, by a step. Nice defensive play from Liguri. And now two outs in the inning. That'll bring up Essman. And you mentioned how uh, red hot Essman has been in the batter's box coming into this game. First uh, at bat was a ground out right to the pitcher with yeah. uh, two runners in scoring position, unable to bring anyone in. But Takes that pitch high. 1 and 0. Oh. Michigan is playing perfectly in the way uh, to win this game. You mentioned it prior to the game. They need strong offense to provide run support and then just lock down pitching, and that's exactly what happened on both fronts so far. There's a called strike 1 and 1. There are a few fans out in the outfield. There's those two sets of bleachers, one set's just got one guy who's reclined and seems to be enjoying himself, and there's an usher there. The second set, there's another usher, but then a group of people, I mean, two or three groups there. I would Looks imagine. like families with yeah, a couple families. children over there. One and two the count on Esmond now. Yeah, it's a real shame. I would imagine a day like this, it's uh, pretty nice weather in a normal gear, the yeah. stadium would probably be packed on a Sunday like this. 1-2 coming is high to Essman. 2-2. Two two. Currently 59 degrees uh, at Alumni Field. Didn't feel chilly at all walking in. Yeah. A couple fans have blankets, but as long as you got a sweatshirt, it's really not bad. 2-2 two, two count. Essman swings and fouls this one back. And uh, Jawan Howard actually posted a photo on Friday. He was yep. in attendance with some of his assistant coaches. I don't seem to see any uh, coaches today for other sports, but we'll keep an eye out for you. 2-2, two -two, Esman swings and hits this one over to short. Going to be a tough play from the knees. No chance there for Klein, or sorry, for Butler, the shortstop. That should go down as an infield single for Esman. Absolutely, and Essman uh, getting on base with two outs. Got in that out. Even if the throw were on line, it would probably have been a bit late. And now Hoganrod will get ready to come in. And there's a conversation in the circle going on between the pitching coach I'm, I'm curious, with, with Maryland already on their third pitcher, whether how, how many pitchers are willing to burn through in this game. Well, they only really have one more option after this. I mean, you, you get a full week for the next series, so workload isn't a big concern, but obviously they... Just haven't found anybody that can get outs pretty consistently right now, and that's their biggest problem. Yeah, Michigan has had at least one run in each inning, at least one home run in each inning, uh, two of which came from the same player. <laughs> Hogan Rod 
He is 0 for 1 today. Lined out to second on that really hard hit ball with two runners aboard. Now with the runner on, Haley's got one homer on the season. one -oh on the way. Swings and just gets a piece of that one. And on deck is uh, Taylor Bump. She had a uh, blast in the second inning. Yeah, Michigan wouldn't mind having her step to the plate with two runners on. Yep. If Haley can extend this inning. 1-1 one, one, called strike. And currently on first is Esman, who has, uh, she's three for three on stolen base attempts this season. Don't think there's a big reason to be super aggressive on the base paths. Already up four runs, but there's a swing and a ground ball right back up the middle. Hoganrod hits that one into center field. Esman will stop at second. And now two runners are aboard. Hoganrod got a good pitch and just spanked it into center field. And now Taylor Bump will come to the plate. With uh, four home runs on the season, one today. Now would be a great time to get another. Michigan leads 4 nothing in the bottom of the third. And two runners on with two outs and one in scoring position with power hitter Taylor Bump at the plate. And shows Bunt, pulls it back for a called strike. Bump had the home run in the second inning. Pitch is Outside one and one, it was to left center field. She's now got four homers on the year, more homers than doubles right now. Slugging has crept over 500. OBP sits at 351. She's 276 with runners aboard. 1-1, one, one. that just outside as well. Schlotterbeck is nibbling on the outside edge, but not getting the calls right now. Two and one. Taylor's worked herself into a good count to hit. The wind up and the pitch. There's a called strike, two and two. It would be huge for Maryland to get out of this inning with only one run surrendered. Uh, four runs is tough to come back to against uh, Michigan's elite pitching, but say goodbye if uh, you give up like six or seven. 2-2 two -two outside. Good take there from Taylor Bump. Sierra Kirsten waiting on deck. Schlotterbeck now one ball away from loading the bases with two outs here in the bottom of the third. The wind up and the pitch, swing and a ground ball, right back up the middle, into right center field. One run will score. They're waving Hoganrod around, relay to the plate, and it will not be in time. A two-run RBI single for Taylor Bump, and it's 6-0 Wolverines. Hoganrod showcasing that speed, coming around from first base on that not even super hardly hit uh, ball. It only went... I uh, was uh, right to the outfielder, but uh, was able to gun out an extra run to make it a 6 nothing ball game. That's three RBIs for Bump already this game. And that's just two out hitting for Michigan. They got two outs with nobody aboard. Now back to back to back singles from Esmond, Hogan, Rod, and Bump. They've made it 6 nothing now, and that brings Sierra Kirsten to the plate. First pitch coming, she swings and fouls that one off. Kirsten isn't a big home run threat, but it's worth noting now with the runner aboard, she represents the potential run rule uh, 
run. Obviously, the run rule, eight runs after five. Michigan now creeping towards that. Oh, one on the way. That pitch, I think, just missed inside, one and one. And Kirsten, she has yet to hit a home run this season, but uh, she is the only freshman in today's lineup to batting batting ninth. One and one the count. Kirsten nubs that one foul, one and two. Solid batting average to a 265 with a uh, 368 slugging, just somewhat low OBP, only 271, so not much higher than that batting average. 1 2 ball down and away. Kirsten hasn't taken any walks on the season, so the only things to bump that OBP up is a hit by pitch. Bump on first, count now 2 and 2 on Kirsten. We're still here in the bottom of the third. We've crossed the one-hour mark of this game. Lexi Blair waiting on deck. 2-2 coming to Kirsten. She swings and is out in front of it. Drives it foul. Kirsten checks back in. Count stays at 2-2. Two and two. The wind up and the pitch, out in front of it again, pops it up sky high in the infield. Schlotterbeck, the pitcher, will take it, and that will end the inning. But Michigan puts three more on the board. They now lead 6 nothing after three innings, and they are in total command right now as Starocco will go back out there. And the grounds crew comes out in between uh, the third and the fourth inning here. Michigan's... You said it, they're commanding on both sides of play. And uh, keeping this up, uh, this will be a pretty quick game. Well, the you know the first question for the Terps is, you know, how are we gonna change our plate approach to have an opportunity to get back in this game because nobody is close to hitting Alex Duraco right now. Seven strikeouts through the first nine hitters. They just look totally baffled do the Maryland hitters. Absolutely. And uh, in that third inning, we saw some contact being made, some foul balls. So not, uh, not quite as many three-pitch strikeouts as there were earlier in the game. But it's... Uh, is it that much of an improvement if you go from a strikeout swinging to a ground ball right up the middle uh, for yeah. an out? Like at that point, it's just semantics almost. <laughs> well, and you know, Maryland is yet to leave the infield. There are two outs on contact, non-strikeouts, where a pop-up in the infield and a ground ball to second. So nothing's been hit terribly hard, and. This is now going to be the second time through the order. Nine up, nine down through the first three innings. We'll see how they change their approach second time through, even though it's not like they haven't seen Starocco before. She just pitched yesterday, so I'm not sure how much a second time through will really change things because this is, for most of the hitters, a third or a fourth time through, counting the game yesterday. First pitch fouled back by McFarland, 0-1. And, and McFarland first inning got that strikeout. I have a feeling I'll be saying that a lot the next <laughs> couple yeah. of batters. 0-1 on the way, and she's way out in front. Pulled the string there, did Starocko. 0-2. O two count. Pitch high. 1-2.
Taranko spins the ball in the right hand, puts it in the glove. One, two, coming. Nubbed, just foul. McFarland definitely again out in front of the off-speed delivery. Just fighting to stay alive. And just looking for anything here, a uh, blue pit, a walk even, just get on base. One, two, swings and just pops this one soft, tailing into the glove of Taylor Bump over there at third for the first out. Looked like jammed a little bit. And still yet yet to leave the infield for, for any ball in play. And uh, most of the balls haven't even had that opportunity yet. Seven strikeouts today uh, out of ten batters faced so far. And that'll bring Taylor Okada to the plate. She had a ground out to second base in the first, so she was one of the few batters to actually put it in play, but uh, was quickly thrown out by Jimenez. First pitch is a called strike. 0-1, fouled back, 0-2. Michigan leads 6-0 in the top of the fourth. Straco winds up, 0-2 coming, swinging a line drive into center field. Blair coming on, and she had the basket catch for a moment. It pops out of the glove, and Maryland's got their first base runner of the game. That was a rocket to right to shallow center field. Coming in was Blair, and it looked like for a minute she had the sliding catch, but just unable to control it. It quickly bounced out. I'm curious to see how they're going to call that. I assume it'll be a hit, yeah. It is marked as a single. I mean, Blair came on, was very close to making a great play, but it's kind of similar to the Amena's double where if you make the play, great, but it's not really one you expect to make. There's a ball to start off Kerr here. So Maryland finally leaves the infield and finally gets a hit, but they got to keep it going here with Regan Kerr at the plate. Off speed, watches it just sail in there. Count to one and one. And you mentioned uh, Storaco's just ability to prevent extra base hits yep. too. Even that hit, which was uh, pretty hardly hit into the outfield, only landed for a single. One, one on the way. Called strike, one and two. Um, Okuda, she, she is five for five on stolen bases. Now Carson keeps popping up to hold Okada on there at first. And I'm, yeah. I, if any time would be to maybe get something going, a stolen base now would be would be it. Count is now run to two and two. Wind up the pitch, swing and a foul back, just getting a piece there was Kerr putting together a decent at-bat and battling a little bit. And it finally seems like uh, Maryland is, I don't know if they cracked Michigan's pitching, but they have at least. At least they're making contact. Yeah, yeah. There's a swing and a tapper foul. Two and two. Because to open up this inning was a hit to third base, so avoided the strikeout, then... A, the first hit of the or, uh, first hit of the game uh, to the outfield, and then right now it's two and two, but with a handful of foul balls in there as well. Really not uh, going down. The wind up at the two two again, swinging a foul back.
2-2 again. Called strike three on the outer edge. Very delayed strike three motion, but rung up by Tanya Gehrig. And there we go with the eighth strike out of the game for, uh, for Michigan. Schlotter back at the plate now. Takes a pitch a little inside. She has uh, quite a low batting average this season, 0.56 on the year. That pitch high, 2-0. and She has a, swipe, a slightly higher OBP, 1, 190, so that... Uh, Comes from uh, two two walks uh, contribute to that too. But there's a swing and a line drive into left field, a solid base hit and a two out single. Now we'll move the runner up to second. That'll bring up Dustin. And uh, it looks like uh, Maryland's coach is gonna. Make a substitution, maybe. Well, Jen Brundage going out there to talk to Starocko and settle her down a little bit as Maryland's finally getting some base runners here in the top of the fourth. And it looks like Megan Mikami will be coming in to hit here, number 44. Rocco shrugs, checks the wristband, and then toes the rubber. Megan Mikami steps, steps in, 235 hitter on the year, 316 OBP. Only extra base hit is a triple. Rather short, so a compressed strike zone. She's batting uh, 250 with runners in scoring position. 1 0 on the way, off speed called strike. Only 167 with two outs, however. Taylor Bump playing in at the bag at third. Allen is in a little bit at the line at first as well. 1 1 count. Mikami takes a called strike right at the knees. Beautiful pitch. And now Starocko ahead, one and two, looking for her ninth strikeout of the day and to end this fourth inning with two runners aboard. A wind up, the pitch, swing and a miss. And Starocko gets the strikeout, strands the two runners. Maryland gets two hits, two left, no runs. And Michigan's batters will go back to the plate now in the bottom of the fourth, leading 6 nothing over the Terps. Yeah, that's the ninth strikeout of the game through four innings, so only uh, three other outs besides besides uh, strikeouts. However, surrendering two hits, both of which to the outfield this past inning. So uh, slightly less dominant than what we've come to expect earlier this game. But... Um, it's now up to Michigan's offense, too. They got a very solid cushion... But uh, each inning, Michigan's offense has scored at least one run, at least one uh, solo home run. Uh, let's see if they're able to keep this up as Lexi Blair comes up for the third time today from the top of the lineup. Well, and this is, you know, again, a big opportunity for Michigan's batters because if you get two runs here in the bottom of the fourth, then you send Storaco up needing just three outs to win the game and end it right there. So... Mm -hmm. If Michigan can keep the offensive train going, they can shorten this game drastically. Absolutely, they could avoid uh, potentially two full innings. Now we're honoring another student manager here before the bottom of the fourth. Top of the lineup, Blair Rodriguez and Allen do up.
Updated scores, Hawkeyes 5, Wildcats 2, Iowa over Northwestern in the top of the fourth there in Iowa City. 4-2 Huskers over the Gophers in the bottom of the fifth in Minneapolis. We'll keep our eye on those games as the day rolls along. Lexi talking with Hutch. And it looks like Jennifer Braun is going to come out to the mound. Uh, so this is the fourth pitcher in the fourth inning already for Maryland. Just nothing is seeming to stick. Pitched uh, against Michigan on Friday. Gave up six hits and four earned runs. Yeah, Jennifer Braun. Was a grad transfer from... University of Pennsylvania in the Ivy League last year. ERA 275's had some really good games, but also, again, roughed up by Michigan a couple days ago. First pitch to Lexi is high. Maryland's now used all four of their pitchers in this game. Mixing and matching, trying to find somebody that can get consistent outs, and it really hasn't happened yet. That pitch way high, 2-0. and oh. Blair walked to begin the game, came around to score, grounded out to first unassisted in the second. Wind up in the 2-0 on the way. Swing and a line drive over the head of the shortstop. Butler and in to left field. Lexi is aboard with a leadoff single. Now that'll bring Ataya Rodriguez to the plate. Lou Allen waiting on deck. Uh, currently, uh, two home runs on two plate appearances for Allen. Um, I'm tempted to see whether that streak will keep up. We'll see what Michigan has Rodriguez do. See if they have her button again with the runner aboard. She's taking all the way, and the first pitch is high. And, uh, yeah, in the, in the first inning with uh, Blair on, uh, Rodriguez uh, put down a bunt to advance, advance Blair. But I don't know with this amount of runs if that's going to be the play call. Well, corners are drawn in just in case. Of course, 1-0 on the way, swinging a fly ball to center field. This one well hit on the run, back to the track, and it bounces off the wall, rolls into right field. This one could be trouble. Rodriguez is going to be held at third. Blair coming home. I think they'll give her a triple on that one. That was very close to the rare Natalia Rodriguez home run, and it goes down as a triple. Michigan now leads 7-0, and that eighth run now standing on third with nobody out in the inning. Yeah, just... Uh... Is, is it 90 feet in softball? No, it's closer than that. Closer to that, just yep. uh, certain distance away from home to end in the game, or uh, in the game after five, potentially. Allen now to the plate. Lou Allen. In softball, it's 60 feet. Yep. So There's 60 a ball. feet away. Obviously, Storaka would have to come back out to finish the game off in the top of the fifth, but we'll see if Lou can drive in another run. Absolutely. Two home runs already today. She's got a pair of RBIs on those two solo shots. 1-0 coming. Swing and just rolls this one foul. Rodriguez, with her speed, is a threat to come home in pretty much any situation, including a wild pitch or passed ball. You saw Michigan score one run like that in the first. Yeah, and uh, now with this big cushion, but still a run would be nice. It, it leads an interesting opportunity for Michigan to kind of be aggressive. There's called strike. One and one to Lou. Yeah, so this game alone, she came in tied for the most home runs, yeah. but now clearly took the lead. One, two, high, two, and two. 
And Michigan's had three home runs in this game, and they've been very close to two more. A Jimenez double off the sort of middle of the wall, and then Rodriguez almost the exact same spot there. 2-2, Lou -two, loops this one into right field, might have a play at the plate, and it'll be caught in the air. I don't know why Rodriguez wasn't ready to tag up and come home there, even if she wasn't going to be sent, but... She, she didn't even tag up or... No, she was or, uh, bouncing around down the base path, and she just took a long look at Hutch. I'm not sure if there was a miscommunication there, but I said there was going to be a play at the plate, and then I looked over to third, and she wasn't standing on third. I don't really know what was going on there. And that, that blast uh, right there, it, it had it went pretty far. It was about... It was going to be an interesting play. Wall, yeah. But instead, it'll be up to Julia Menez now. Seemed like Lou did enough to maybe get that run in, but... Anyway, now Jimenez comes up. She is one for two today. First pitch fouled off herself. She had that uh, double in the first inning, and she was left stranded at third. Owen won the count. Jimenez, whose uniform is extremely dirty, Steps back in. Comes up for the first time with any runners on, on base. This one fouled right at us, and it will bounce on the roof. Now Jimenez is behind 0-2. Bran is trying to wiggle out of a situation here with a runner on third. Nobody out in the inning then gets a fly ball out looking for her second out of the frame. Jimenez needs to put this ball in play. Yeah, ideally... Basically, any ball in play is a potential to score a run. 0-2, oh, way high, and Rodriguez is going to come home. Throw to the plate, not going to be in time. That one bounced off the glove of Dustin, and the run comes home regardless. Michigan scores their second on a ball that got away from the catcher. They now lead 8-0. And as the fight song plays, uh, base is empty for Michigan with one out in the bottom of the fourth. This game is uh, taking quite a while, but it's incredibly one-sided. The yep. tops of the innings have been quite quick, and the bottoms have been quite long. That one is swung on and hit up the middle. Going to be a tough play. No play at all. Jimenez beats it out to first. It'll be an infield single that Liguri just couldn't get a handle on. And with that, Michigan keeps their offensive rolling, offensive movement moving. Carson comes to the plate. Hannah Carson will check in, and they're going to get a pinch runner down there at first. It'll be Kaylee Rodriguez. Freshman hasn't gotten to play a ton this season, but she will stand over there at first with Hannah Carson at the plate. So assuming this result holds, this will be a sweep for Michigan in this weekend series, as well as uh, Michigan would have a five-game win or six-game winning streak. That pitch taken high to Hannah Carson. Michigan has one eight-nothing run rule, eight-nothing after five against Wisconsin. That was back in Leesburg, Florida, at the beginning of the season. This would be a similar situation if they don't add any more runs, they've already got a runner on first. And now that one is swung on and laced into the gap by Carson. Rodriguez headed to third. She will be waved around, throw to the cutoff, to the plate, and it is in time for the out throw over to third. Not in time. They gun down Kaylee Rodriguez at the plate on a great relay there from the second baseman. I think Liguri made the throw there. It might have been, yeah. Might have been Kerr. No, it wasn't Kerr. Yeah, I think it was Liguri. That was a gutsy play to send send her around, send Rodriguez from third, because it, it found its way in the gap, but the outfielder got to it pretty quickly and uh, didn't get the best jump off of the, the ball either. I mean, you might as well. You're up 8 nothing, and see if you can squeeze out another run. Now we're going to have a pinch hitter. It'll be Kiki Thole 
here coming in for Lauren Essman. Hutch starting to that was delve a, a little bit into her bench. Got to see a great move heads up play by Carson too. Yeah, because to when the third. throw went home, she advanced to third and there was a throw at third, but she, she beat it out by a second or two. There's a first pitch. Misses the zone. Kiki Thole, of course, related to Michigan assistant coach Bonnie Thole. Kiki has played a little bit this season, but uh, not a ton. One for seven on the year. That one hit was a double. She does have a walk, three strikeouts. Getting an opportunity to hit here in a game where Michigan is now very comfortably up. Thole fouls it back, one and one. Yeah, and with uh, eight runs now, um, a potential ninth on third base with two outs. Uh, Michigan's in the perfect position they want to be in. Brand gets ready, and now we'll step off. Time call. One one on the way, off speed, low, and down and and inside as well. Thole taps the plate, two one count. Brand looks to the dugout. Two one on the way, off speed called strike two and two. Good pitch there, runner on third, two outs in the inning. And potentially this could be Michigan's last batter of the game, depending on how the top of the fifth goes. Ground ball over to short. Going to be a quick play across the diamond. Picked it first, and good defensive play there from Butler to Kerr. Maryland's defense there saves a couple runs in the bottom of the fourth. Michigan puts up two more. They got two in the first, one in the second, three in the third, two here in the fourth. And now we head to the top of the fifth. Michigan up 8 nothing, and we're going to see Sarah Schaefer come in. She'll have the duty of clinching the victory. And I, I was reluctant to mention this until now out of maybe having a broadcaster's jinx, but I feel at this point might as well go ahead and say it. Michigan has yet to lose. They haven't lost at Alumni Field during a regular season game since Sunday, May 6, 2018. So to put that in perspective, uh, my broadcast partner, Alex Train, he was a freshman yep. then, and he is now a week away from graduating. So that is how, how long it has been since a regular season loss. Obviously, last season, they didn't even have any games at home because they played a handful of games, but it was all uh, road tournaments in, in Florida. And yeah road games and then the season before that they lost in the regionals which were held in Ann Arbor but they they went undefeated during the regular season so then um this game was against Ohio State uh, on May 6 and they that was the final game of the 2018 season they already clinched the Big Ten championship uh for that one but um they they surrendered the final game of the season which was at home and now Michigan looks to keep that streak con uh, alive it would be a pretty big shock right now if they are unable to do that with this eight run lead and it's very possible they could do it uh, with this as their final final three batters well Sarah Schaefer coming into the game now is pitched a little bit this season. Three innings, three hits allowed, one strikeout. She missed all of last year with an injury and has really just been kind of used sparingly over her Michigan career, but she stayed in the program when other players have transferred and shows a certain commitment. And Michigan is using her as arguably their number three pitcher this year. They haven't used really many pitchers besides the big two of Starocco and Bobian. There's a called strike. Dennis has pitched a little bit. Schaefer's pitched a little bit. But Sarah gets the opportunity to end the game. Called strike one to a pinch hitter, Shelly Yonkin. Sorry, Shelby Yonkin. 
The wind up in the 0-1. There's a swing and a line drive right back up the middle. A base hit into center field. So one runner takes uh, takes base early in this fifth inning. And pretty quickly, too, just on that uh, second pitch. Schaefer, a native of West Des Moines, Iowa. As a freshman in 2016, she got to play a little bit last year. Not as much. We got a handful of substitutions. Yeah. We got a pinch runner on first. We got... Campbell Klein, and then we got a pinch hitter at the plate, and uh, Taylor Wilson. Taylor Wilson. So uh, pulling out all the stops here to potentially avoid that um, the the mercy ruled uh, game. Taylor Wilson at the plate, waiting to get her stats pulled up here on the stat sheet. First pitch called strike. Schaefer's been able to find the zone pretty well this season. The problem has been sometimes finding too much of the zone, but solid single there to begin the frame. Oh, one is down and in. Obviously, this is a situation now where we talk about Maryland's defense playing a role because this could be 10 nothing or even worse in that last half inning, but they were able to throw a runner out at the plate and then a nice defensive play from 6-3 put out to end the frame as well. 1-1 one, one count. Swing and a slow roller over to second. They're gonna flip to second for one, but it is mishandled. A bad flip from Jimenez and both runners are safe and now Schaefer is in a bit of a prickly situation. Fielder's choice E4, we've just been told, is the official ruling there, and I think that's the right play. Amena's definitely had time to get the lead runner. It was the right decision to flip to get yeah. the lead runner. But but she definitely had time to even get settled and throw to first, even if uh, not flipping it over to second. But the way it was positioned, it was a uh, bloop grounder, and it kind of drew her towards second, so her momentum was bringing her to the base, and then... I think we got another pinch runner on for Maryland. We yeah, got they're going to reinsert Ruby Butler. Butler. And now Liguri will come to the plate. Two runners aboard, nobody out. Maryland threatening. And this is actually uh, a pinch hitter, yep. too, so not, uh, not Liguri. Michaela Abatine, it looks like. There's a called strike. And with uh, no outs, Maryland has had probably the most offense they've had all game. Just one run in would uh, give them the opportunity to play a couple more frames. Oh, one is high, one and one. Well, obviously, they've been given a bit of a breath of fresh air in finally not having to face Alex Duraco for the first time all weekend. Either her or Bobian not in the game. One one coming, way high and outside, but a great play by Carson to get up and snag it. Absolutely, uh, would have probably advanced both runners. Otherwise. Two one count at the moment. Straco winds up, 2-1 coming, swing and a hard foul back. Sorry, Schaefer there. Score update, Minnesota has battled back to tie 4-4 in the sixth against Nebraska. Iowa still holding to a 5-2 lead over Northwestern, that one in the bottom of the fifth. Schaefer winds up, 2-2 two -two coming. That one skips in. Carson gets down and blocks it again. Some really, really good defensive plays here by Hannah Carson behind home plate, keeping these runners at first and second. Exactly, and likely uh, 
advan uh, preventing any advancement, which would both put uh, an additional runner in scoring position and take out any force out, too, at third base. 3-2 coming, swing and a long, soft liner into center field. Lexi coming on, makes the play for the first out of the inning. Holds the runners there, just a tailing liner into center. And Blair is able to get there for the out. And with that, uh, Maryland records their first out of this fifth inning. So they have uh, another pinch hitter come to the plate. Number 17, Marissa Borkowski. Yeah, they are just getting everybody a chance to play here in the top of the fifth. Borkowski will come in for Jones. McFarland on deck. That'll flip to the top. There's a called strike. And for the first time all game, it seems like Maryland's dugout is really getting loud, making yeah, some noise. Trying to will their team back into it. Two runners aboard, one out. Bunt shown, pulled back as the pitch is high, one and one. Yeah, up until now, Maryland didn't have much to get loud about, but with two runners on and one out, uh, first opportunity presents itself. Schaefer sighs, spins the ball in the right hand, twists the wind up, the 1-1, one -one, swing and a miss. I actually think they did get a piece of the bat. Garrick immediately signaled for a foul ball. We'll dust the plate off again. Now one and two would be big if Schaefer could just get a swing and a miss here. Yeah, bring it with a one out uh, at the end of the game for the Wolverines. And that was, um, if, it, if it wasn't fouled, if it wasn't called a foul tip, we likely would have seen an advancement. Uh, Klein was uh, moving quite a bit down the base path. One and two the count. Schaefer winds up. The pitch down and away. The inning began with a single, and then Wilson hit a slow roller over to second that Michigan went for the out at second to nip the lead runner. Had enough time to do it, but Jimenez tossed to Rodriguez, not close there, and it was marked as an error. That has put Schaefer in this prickly position. 2-2 Two -two coming. Just a little bit low. Good frame there from Carson. Now the count runs full. McFarland, Maryland's best hitter, waiting on deck. Michigan's put Schaefer into this game for an opportunity to get some work in a low leverage situation. Exactly. The, the freshman getting an opportunity at the plate midway through the season. There's a swing and a miss. Schaefer sits down. Borkowski, and now McFarland will come to the plate. Representing Maryland's last chance with two runners on in two outs. Michigan leads 8-0 in the top of the fifth. Run rule is eight runs after five. So just one out here doesn't uh, have to be pretty. Could be a fly out to the warning track. Anything uh, will do to wrap up this game for the Wolverines. Jada McFarland 0 for 2 today. Starocco winds up the pitch, swing and a ground ball right back to the pitcher. Schaefer throws over, and that'll do it. And Michigan's dugout empties. The players come out there high-fiving, and they'll huddle up there. And the fight song sounds, and the team will all skip down the line towards the big block M on the right field line. Michigan defeats... Maryland today, 8-0, and they finish off the four-game sweep of the Terps. And now we'll advance to 21-4. And, 
and they on the will season. play next game is on Friday against Northwestern. Same stadium right here in Alumni Field. We will be covering it. Yep. And it will be at uh, ESPNU as well. If you'd That'll like video of that. And then that uh, will begin a four-game series against Northwestern, one of the top three teams in this Big Ten Conference. That'll be a big weekend for sure. Michigan played very, very well this weekend, and they are entering that series on a roll. We'll see if they can keep it up then. Any last thoughts from today? Just uh, they, it's hard to play a better game. Their offense was firing. Their power was firing. They looked great on the base paths, and their pitching was phenomenal. I, I, Michigan could not have asked for a better performance. And Michigan scores in every inning they went up to bat. One, two in the first, one in the second, three in the third, two in the fourth, eight runs total, and the Wolverines defeat the Terps. Stiracco will get another win, and Michigan moves in 21-4 and, and first place in the conference. For that, from Adam Bressler, I'm Alex Drain saying good night and go blue from Alumni Field.